resolution or rather an agreement from stemming from our midterm review, we will be receiving a briefing on the master skills plan um, and on legislation in the post-school education sector um, <clears throat> that is currently outstanding. Um, with, I believe we are joined by the minister, Bladen Zimande, who I can see on the platform. And uh, we have received an apology from the deputy minister, if I'm not mistaken, Anele. Um, can we also check what other apologies we've received, Anele? Good morning, Chair and honorable members. Uh, Chairperson, I've not received any apologies uh, from the members. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Anele, for that. Um, we now will be moving on to the presentation. I think, Minister, you know, when it comes to the master skills plan in particular, I think there was a lot of excitement coming from the um, midterm review to hear about this consolidated plan, considering how, um, firstly, I mean, when you look at unemployment and you look at the investment of our government into education, there is, I guess, at some point at this juncture, and um, particularly, I guess, looking at um, industry, one always wonders um, when they say that we don't have the requisite skills for you know, them to take in our young graduates, then what skills do they, do they think we ought to be um, providing? And I think that also speaks to whether the master skills plan would look into um, consultation with the private sector and other um, spaces of industry. Um, when you look at various government departments doing their own audits of skills that are needed in, within their sectors, um, this perhaps this master skills plan can really assist us in having a more consolidated approach um, as, 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 as a government, as a country. Um, so, so even when, you know, when it looks, when we look into curriculum and what we should be offering in the CET program, vis-a-vis -vis in the TVET program, vis-a-vis -vis in the university program, Will the master skills plan be able to assist us in better shaping um, the curricula in, in these different programs of the department? I think those are some of the, the really exciting, um, uh, I don't know, um, elements of the master skills plan that we would like to hear about. Um, and then of course with legislation, uh, we, we, we did not also get to that particular discussion during the midterm review. Um, and so we, 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 we would also like an update from yourselves on where we are sitting as a department. Um, so not having, not, not saying more at this point in time, I think we can hand over to the minister who will then lead the delegation from the department. Thanks, Minister. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, of the portfolio committee, Ms. Nompendurum Kacho. Uh, let me greet you and also let me greet the honorable members uh, of this portfolio committee. Um, let me also greet all other participants who are part of this process today as observers. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity, uh, Chair. Uh, the presentation, uh, I'm going to be handing it over to the DG, who will possibly also hand it over to the relevant officials, just to take you through these two main issues that we have asked us to come and present about today. Firstly, the master skills plan, and then secondly, our legislative program. <clears throat> so I'll cover both in my introduction, uh, Chair, because I think also even in the presentation, they just come one after the other. Of course, we will decide how we, 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 we discuss this. Also, thanks for your understanding for asking to be released just before 12, as I have to go and finalize preparations for this afternoon's uh, question and answer session, which is another very important platform 
where we are expected to account to parliament. Let me just start with the master skills plan, uh, Chair. The master skills plan <coughs> will be explained that the objective really is to bring together a whole lot of plans that exist that have got an impact on our strategy to provide skills in our country. There is something that is contained about skills in the National Development Plan. Uh, we also have the National Skills Development Plan, which is required by the Still Skills Development Act, uh, which also guides mainly uh, the CETAs on, 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 on what is to be done. And then we have got enrollment targets, by the way, which are a very important parts of skills planning. People tend not to sometimes appreciate the significance of enrollment plans in our institutions, the universities and our TVET colleges. For instance, if we say to the universities, we're gonna be expecting you to produce so many engineering graduates this academic year, that's part of skills planning. Okay, there may be other factors that actually uh, affect that. And then we have got other, put, other important inputs into our skills planning, which is our overall economic plans uh, of government. At the moment, for instance, we have got the economic recovery and reconstruction program. We did some extensive work on the skills implications of that and what we need to do. Now, we also have got the industrial master plans that are being led by the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. No. And also there are other realities that, by the way, impact on our skills plans. The output from basic education, for instance, does impact uh, on our skills planning in quite a fundamental way. If we want to produce so many engineers, artisans, and so on, that is shaped also by the, the numbers of matriculants who come out with 60% minimum maths and science. So given all this, Chair, we have now then said, if the, 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 the plan for the fifth administration is to actually focus on priority skills amongst other things, let's try and pull this together into a master skills plan. In other words, a plan that tries to bring together all these things under one plan. And of course, the nature of the plan will be such that what we will be talking about are iterations. It possibly will be a plan that, will, by that I mean, different versions that you will have to have. Maybe we'll have to update it yearly or after two years or after three years. That's the work that we're actually going still to do as we develop it. So that as things change, we are also able to actually adapt it. Like the industrial policy action plan here has iterations, for instance, because things do change. But we are planning to produce the first iteration of a master skills plan by the end of this financial year, and thereafter take that to cabinet, hopefully then for, ad for adoption. So <clears throat> the purpose therefore is actually to bring together and have one country, one plan one master skills plan. It's got challenges, it's not an easy process to bring together all these elements that I've outlined and in a dynamic and forever changing situation. And also we'll be producing this at a time when our economy is not in good shape at all. And we must be conscious therefore that our master skills plan is not patched 
just only informed by an economy that is down, but also will have to anticipate, hopefully, some growth and development in our economy. Now, the other matter that I just need to say, by the way of background chair, is that one of the key issues that the master skills plan will have to incorporate, and it must be embedded in it, is the relationship between formal training institutions and workplaces. That's the single biggest weakness that we still have in South Africa. The other day, we invited you to a Tibet Industry Summit, which was aiming at trying to bring industry together with Tibet colleges and closer. You can't have vocational education without that partnership. You can't have production of technologies through the technologies through our universities of technology without a close university industry partnership, for instance. Now, we hope also that this, this will bridge this anomaly. Sometimes you get people from industry and say, yeah, it's Monday. The, the kinds of graduates you are giving us are not up to scratch. But many of those graduates, in order to be up to scratch, especially from Tibet and universities of technology, require workplace exposure. So industry can't just criticize government unless itself it says, this is how we are going to come in and partner. So that will have to be a very crucial component and dynamic of a responsive uh, master skills plan, that relationship. <clears throat> so what we are going then to be doing today is just to outline the process. Because the other thing, as I say, Chair, the process will have ultimately the real master skills plan that when we develop it, it will have to be approved by cabinet. We are still in very early stages at the moment, but we just thought you requested us, let's share no matter how early we are, so that at least you get a sense of where we want to go uh, with, the, with the process. Obviously also as part of developing the master skills plan, we'll have to do some international benchmark what do other countries do, especially those that have got relatively successful skills planning or skills production that actually respond to their economic needs? We will have to look at a few of those countries and say, what is it that they are doing well and what can we learn out of that? Of course, without just mechanically copy. So that's the introduction to the master skills plan in terms of the presentation. It's a process that we are outlining. It's not content today. It's just the process of what we, we, we actually want to do. And of course, the portfolio committee is welcome to make some comments. On legislation, uh, Chair, also what I would like to say is that there are two pieces of legislation that we are immediately dealing with right now is the central application uh, system, CAS, as we call it, which we will have to legislate if we are to bring it about, which is one of the commitments that we have as this government that we need a central application scheme. The arrangement, so, sorry, central application system. I'm thinking of NESFAS all the time, Chair, so scheme is in my mind all the time. It's a central application system so that we make it easier uh, for our young people. Like it's happening at UKZN, they've got uh, that province, at least your higher education institutions have got that. Uh, so that you, have, you make one application as a student and not apply to many institutions. We need to legislate for that. And also the other piece of legislation that we are dealing with is the national qualifications framework so that we make sure that we've got an aligned system. But I do need to say, Chair, up front, that given the amount of work that still needs to be done and the, the, the time it also takes to finalize legislation, you know this better as parliament, we may not be able to have this legislation passed during the sixth parliament. In which case, then those matters will have to be picked up anew by the seventh parliament. But on our side, we will continue to prepare and to do as much work as possible 
uh, as the department. Uh, as you will get the briefing, some of this there have been consultations already about draft bills, you know, and so on, uh, as we are actually shaping it. And uh, <clears throat> we are then going to continue with that. But we can absolutely guarantee that we'll be able to go through all these processes during the sixth parliament. But we'll continue to do the work because even the new parliament, when it picks up on these things, at least there would have been some groundwork done by the department. So I will hand over then to, to the DG chair without taking any further time. And to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity just to introduce this. I will then hand over to Dr. Sishu will then indicate uh, how the presentations will be made. Thank you very much, chair and honorable members. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> I don't seem to, okay, there we go. I think DG's mic is open now. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, uh, allow me to take this opportunity to, <clears throat> uh, to recognize the, the chairperson of the portfolio committee and uh, all, all honorable members of the portfolio committee present um, and thank the minister uh, for uh, providing a very clear indication of the status of the presentations that we are making today. And uh, we appreciate this uh, minister. Uh, thank you very much. Um, allow me uh, chairperson to just make a few remarks before DDG Casa commences with the presentation. Um, firstly, that uh, when it comes to the master skills plan, as the minister has indicated, the mandate uh, or the policy mandate uh, for the, this work emanate from a, a couple of uh, pieces of legislation that are important for us to share with you, including the, the National Development Plan that directs us to improve systems for skills planning and shape the production of skills. And uh, I think therefore, uh, the, this provides the, the context and uh, explain uh, much clearer uh, what are the broad frameworks that uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, frame the, the work that we are doing. The white paper on post school education and training uh, asserts that uh, better intergovernmental coordination will be required to support policy alignment and the implementation in an, a differentiated system. This, uh, uh, you know, again empowers uh, our department. Uh, to work with other government departments in ensuring that uh, we, we attain the policy mandates emanating from our white paper. Uh, going back to the national plan for post-school education and training that is calling upon for the establishment of a clear and a streamlined roles and responsibilities of key stakeholders and role players involved in education and training as well as the medium term strategic framework that commits our government to adopting a demand led skills planning approach and first uh, you know developing a priority skills plan uh, all of these uh, provide the uh, the mandate for the work that we are presenting today the minister in his uh, you know opening remarks has uh, provided us with a, a kind of a problem statement that uh, explains the purpose of the work that we are presenting. And there are two key issues emanating from the minister's input. One is the socioeconomic challenges that uh, we seek to address. And uh, in slide four, uh, we provide some of them. The list is not exhaustive, uh, but uh, it, 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 it captures 
the key areas uh, uh, that uh, we seek to address. Despite, uh, uh, of, of course, the, the, the second statement being the organizational problems that we seek to address. And again, in this regard, Chairperson, we, we provide a set of organizational issues, most of which the minister has covered uh, in his uh, opening remarks. We are looking forward, Chair, to uh, working with our, our counterparts across all government and state-owned uh, entities, including working with our stakeholders in putting together uh, the plan uh, for, for this country, one plan for one country as the minister has, uh, has, has, has indicated. We are looking forward to this conversation uh, and, and uh, we, we thank you for the opportunity, Chairperson. Uh, regarding the second issue of the legislation, I think the minister has covered sufficiently all the, the issues which I would have loved to, to, to raise with you. Allow me with your permission, Chair, uh, to kindly uh, ask uh, uh, DDG uh, Nolo Azikasa, the DDG for Planning, Policy and Strategy of the Department uh, to lead the presentation. Thank you, DG. Good morning, good morning, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Minister, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Chair uh, Committee. Uh, I would like to uh, appreciate the opportunity to table the Master Skills presentation and apologize upfront uh, for my voice. I have a bit of flu and I hope that I'm audible. And, and, and stop a little bit to ensure that I am as audible as I would like to be. We can hear you, Thank you very much. May I request please that my presentation is loaded so that I can begin. And thank you very much. If it can please be put on slideshow. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson, with your permission, I will try to be very brief because I believe that our minister has foregrounded the presentation and, uh, and also ably uh, the, the DG has also made some very uh, critical uh, opening remarks. And mine then is to just zoom in on some of the key points uh, that uh, perhaps uh, would need a uh, to be emphasized. Um, in the main, uh, the baton that we have been given as the, the, the Department of Higher Education and Training um, is, has been the request that we come up with one country, uh, sorry, one plan uh, for one country. Um, this is work that we were given by the minister following a discussion that took place uh, in the interministerial a committee uh, on, on science and innovation, and it is work that we're very excited about. And we intend to share with you the process that we will be following in developing this master skills plan. Next slide, please. In the main, um, the, the development of the master skills plan will follow a number of process steps. And as the minister, indicated when I make this presentation, I will take you through uh, solely the, the, the process. And um, the one of the critical steps for developing the master skills plan will include the development of the concept notes. And so um, in the main, the concept notes will seek to guide, steer and frame the development of the master skills plan and achieve stakeholder consensus on broad areas and the approach to the master skills plan. Next uh, uh, slide, please. Uh, as the minister indicated earlier on, uh, uh, the National Development Plan does talk about the, the need for, 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 for having a, a, 
uh, important systems for skills planning and shaping the production of skills that our country uh, needs at this uh, at this particular uh, moment. And then our white paper, as the DG indicated, speaks about better intergovernmental coordination that is critical for supporting policy alignment and implementation in a, in a differentiated system. And then the National Plan for Post-School Education and Training uh, assets and co calls for the establishment of a clear and streamlined roles, roles and responsibilities for key stakeholders and role players involved in education and training, and the medium-term strategic framework uh, that we are currently guided by commits development to adopting demand-led skills planning and approaches, and, 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 and specifically talks about a priority skills plan. Next slide, please. The problem statement that we respond to, and I believe that we all share in this room, um, is, is, is the fact that we face quite a lot of socioeconomic challenges. Um, we spoke about this, for example, uh, we've spoken about this, for example, uh, the socioeconomic challenges that we face. Uh, for example, the low levels of education att attainment in our labor force as a country are cause for great concern. The existence of skills shortages and the need for importing skills labor, skilled labor, is a, a cause for great concern for us. And the mismatch between skills supply and demand is a, a matter for great, great concern. Uh, on, on almost everybody's uh, lips right now is the matter of skills mismatches, the high numbers of underqualified and overqualified water, uh, workers, and mismatches between qualifications and occupations. Uh, public perceptions about the quality of basic education is also another huge matter of concern in the high levels of inefficiencies in, in the system because of high levels of dropouts, repetitive, repetitive, uh, repetitive and, and low throughput is also a huge concern. Um, this also um, seems to be happening largely because of a high proportion of a GDP on education and training. And our view is that we are well placed as a PSAT system to work with other stakeholders to address the above mentioned challenges. The next problem statement is a, a, a um, is is mostly according to organizational challenges. There are gaps in services with uh, very few uh, limited expertise in terms of uh, the bringing together of national, provincial, and, and government departments to deal with skills. And there is a duplication of services and with, with a uh, with a, a number of bodies playing a uh, similar roles. There's a, a wastage of resources. There are silo operations across the broad, uh, across the board. There's possible overreach in terms of functional mandates, and there is lack of policy coherence and, and, and alignment. And there's cause concern of concern uh, regarding absence of composites and comprehensive countrywide data and information. And unfortunately, the indications that there's no centralized place to look at the amount of money spent on education and, and training. And it is our intention that we have a, 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 an HRD strategy that is revisited to deal with the above mentioned uh, challenges. Next slide, please. Our intention then is that as the preset system, we work with a, with many stakeholders to ensure that there is one plan, one skills development plan for one country. And that we provide a well-coordinated and focused mechanism uh, to address imbalances of skills supply demand in South Africa. The plan, together with associated processes and structures, is expected to bring about coherence, rationalism, 
and improve the efficiencies of the skills planning and de delivery system in the country. It will clarify institutional arrangements that provide clear leadership and responsibilities for key elements of this of the skill system. We intend to ensure that the plan serves as an anchor for good practice and a pledge for political and collective will and commitment. We intend to ensure that the plan builds on existing national skills plan. The minister mentioned quite a few of these, that we have got a plethora of plans, um, both development oriented, some economic uh, oriented. And our intention is that we use these to, to ensure that we direct the skills planning regime in South Africa and we ensure that there is better coordination. The next uh, slide, please. As there are certain research questions that we will use the process to, 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 to answer. For example, what are the current gaps that exist in the current skills planning regimes? What problems is the, is, is the master skills plan expected to solve? What is the nature and extent of skills planning at national, provincial, and local levels in South Africa? What are the key skills need for economic and social development? What is the nature and extent of the imbalances between skills supply and demand? What are the reasons for imbalances between skills supply and demand in South Africa? What kinds of interventions will best address imbalances between skills supply and demand? What principles and pillars will underpin the interventions? Who will undertake the interventions necessary? Um, how can skills planning and delivery be optimally coordinated and rationalized against the, the, uh, across the country to improve effectiveness and optimize the use of state resources? How can the public and private sectors work together to better respond to imbalances between skills, supply, and demand? Chairperson, this is more like the diagnostic uh, part of the, of the process that we'll be following, which the minister and the DG referred to. The principles for the process of developing the MSP will, will, will be uh, the following. We will seek inclusivity. We want to bring on board everyone, uh, a, a chairperson and honorable members. The process will include key stakeholders of levels uh, uh, of government, the private sector, labor, NGOs, public and private education and training. We seek uniqueness. Uh, we intend to uh, you know, ensure that we, we, we are unique. And then we want to ensure that there's clarity in terms of roles and responsibilities. We want to facilitate linkages with other uh, skills plans and processes and integrate skills developments across all spheres. We want to be comprehensive. We want to keep this short and simple so that it provides a focus on key issues to be addressed. Monitoring and evaluation will be very critical to enable reporting uh, mechanisms. We want this to be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Next slide, please. The approach uh, to the development of the master skills plan, as we've indicated, is going to be a phased approach. We want this to be driven by an evidence-based approach to skills planning as opposed to an arbitrary or opinion-based approach. Secondly, we want this to be undertaken by the DHS Labor Market Intelligence Research Program. It will be undertaken in two phases. Phase one, will include the stakeholder consultations and review of documents and, uh, and the diagnostic work that I've just referred to. Phase two will include the development of the countrywide master skills plan and also according to the SEAS work that is led by the presidency. And then the master skills plan will be developed as an implementation plan uh, for the reconceptualized HRD strategy of South Africa. Next slide, please. 
Structures to guide the MSP development process will include the Human Resource Development Council Standing Committee on Skills Planning. As the uh, honorable members are aware, the HRDC is chaired by our deputy president and supported by our minister, uh, uh, Dr. Platon Zemande, and includes all stakeholders across the country who are involved in all matters pertaining to human resource development. And then secondly, the, the Intergovernmental Forum on Skills will provide inputs to the MSP process through its representation on the HRDC Standing Committee on Skills Planning. Next slide, please. Thank you ever so much. I hope I was not too quick and that I was audible. And I wish to thank uh, the portfolio chair and honorable members, the minister, the deputy minister, the DG and all colleagues uh, present. Over to you, portfolio chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm worried. I don't know if it's my network that's bad. Um, your side as well, or is it just my side? It's your side, sure. Thanks, Honorable uh, Manami. So, um, I will change devices just now. Can I ask that we, uh, DG and Minister, can I ask that we move on to the next presentation on legislation, please? Uh, yes, Chair. With, with, uh, if, if, if that's what you prefer, we are fine. Uh, we do not have a problem. I had already done the, the, the introduction to these pieces of legislation. And these presentations are going to be very short because also we are not at the stage of dealing with contents of bills, but we are dealing with the process of developing these bills uh, so that then they can be formally tabled in parliament at an appropriate time. Uh, I think that it's still the uh, DG General as DG who is doing this, or maybe the DG wants to properly then introduce that. Over to you, DG. With your permission, Chair. Yes, you may go ahead, Minister, and DG. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I will hand over to DG Kasa. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Honor uh, Digi. Uh, Digi, I had invited, with your permission, Advocate Kuta, uh, to please take us through at a high level uh, through the, the legislation. But as Minister had indicated, and Digi, um, the request was that we keep this at a, a high level. With your permission, DG, may I ask Advocate Kuta to take us through the high level legislation work, if that's all right, DG? You're welcome. Thank you, DG. Advocate Kuta, are you here? Uh, seeing as she is not here, DG, uh, maybe then let me take the house through the, the slides. Uh, may I request that the slides be flighted, please? May I request the slides to be flighted on CAS and NQF? They are part of the master skills plan. Uh, 
Uh, you have any problem, Mr. Mkiba? It's about four slides. Sorry, uh, DDG, I don't have the slides on my side. Could we ask uh, maybe Anele to assist, please? All right. Apologies to put you on the spot. Did it in Valo, might you have them? Did it Kasa, is the same presentation if the one who beamed uh, it can assist us in uh -huh. re-beaming the same presentation because it's your it's last right slide. Yes, Indeed. yes. Mm -hmm. I thank you. Yes. May the old the old uh, slides be beamed because it's right on the same slide. Sorry, DDG Casa, the one I used did not have the the part on legislation. DDG mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, Valo, uh, maybe if you could assist from uh, side. Chair, can I just come in with your permission? If we are not having this, have we not circulated it to the members of the portfolio committee so that we do not waste time? If we can't load them, at least we can talk to that them. There it is. There it is. Okay. Um, Sorry, Chair. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's fine, Minister. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may proceed, Portfolio Chair. Yes, did you say may continue? No, thank you very much. As as the minister and the DG indicated in their opening remarks, there are two pieces of work, uh, uh, legislative work that is currently in progress. It's the central application system, and it's also the the national qualifications framework. Um, Following the midterm review uh, process, uh, the discussions with the portfolio committee were that uh, it would be advisable if if the department uh, had a, a table the discussion on the legislative work and the policy work. So we requested that we table the legislative work and then at a later stage, we table the policy work. And as the minister has indicated, um, we are tabling the central application system work. And uh, what we have on the slide right now is an update of work in progress regarding the central application system work. And we are giving an indication of progress to date. Number one, the fact that given work that's been done so far, the central application system work has been uh, has been um, tabled at NEDLEC uh, for discussion further because the intention is to make sure that this is 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 made given it's important that this is taken to legislation uh, phase. And then the other intention is for, for this to be initiated at a pre-parliamentary uh, submission process. The main issue is that there is a pre-parliamentary report on the draft bill 2023 that's been received uh, by the Office of the Chief State Law Advisor. And then the department is finalizing the review of the draft bill uh, based on the pre-parliamentary report. Um, what we felt we should not include at this stage in time uh, are internal processes in terms of structures, progress to date, um, um, the, the structures and progress to date that's been enabled by the department to fast track this work that has taken some time. But indeed, a lot of work has taken place in, in, this, in this regard. Um, for example, um, at least on a monthly basis, there are there's senior management meetings taking place on the casework, and then a progress report has been taken to NetLake as indicated there. And as mentioned there, this is used to also uh, engage stakeholders at NetLake and resolve any issues.
issues that do come up and need to be resolved. And, and that is taken in tandem with the pre-parliamentary work that is, that, is, that is being resolved. Next slide, please. Now, um, the, the second slide, slide uh, 14, I believe, is really around a, a, a bill plan um, that seeks to give a particular breakdown for the dates that we have got in, in, in plan. Um, perhaps it's my age here, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a draft that we've got in plan for intended dates that we've got for when the bill will be taken through uh, for <clears throat> feedback from the minister, public comments, um, uh, parliamentary processes and when that's going to be taken through in terms of uh, being taken to the office for the chief state law advisors, receiving the legal certificates, uh, all of that culminating in a CR certificate as managed by the uh, DPME in the presidency, the draft cabinet memo, the review thereof, and then um, once more being taken back to the cabinet memo. Uh, the next slide, please. And then, then the next slide is also uh, around similar uh, matters being taken through the, the, the cluster back to the cabinet memorandum and then right, to, right through to the, to the parliamentary uh, process. Uh, taking us to December, the end of this, this de December 2023. Next slide, please. Then the next one is the, uh, excuse me, I think we might have gone a little bit too fast, the National Qualifications Framework. This one, as the honorable members are aware, is a very critical piece uh, for the PSET system. Um, it's also one that's been in the draw, drawing uh, for some time and is critical for the framing um, of the qualifications in the PSAT system. And amendments have been made for quite some time. And uh, the quality councils have also played a role here as articulated oh, in our, uh, yes. Okay, um, and, and quality councils have also played a role here working with us as the department and the intention oh. is to also fast track this. The next slide, please. The first draft of the amendment bill has been developed and circulated among stakeholders, as I mentioned earlier on, SACWA in particular and quality <laughs> council. This has mostly Sorry, been- Sorry, Didi Gasa. Can we ask that we all mute our devices, please? Thank you, Portfolio Chair. And, uh, and um, the further comments on the first draft have been received and are currently being considered by the department. The department is also busy developing the legislative plan. Next slide, please. I think this is the last slide. Thank you very much, uh, Portfolio Chair and all honorable members. Uh, this is where we're at at this point in time. As indicated by the DG at the last midterm review, our plan is to table as soon as possible uh, the, the policy work of the department um, uh, for consideration and discussion with the portfolio committee, uh, bearing in mind global, uh, continental and national uh, developments. And at this point in time, the guidance we've been given is that we do this as a collective and primarily led uh, by, by uh, the, the planning branch and fully supported by the office of the DG. DG, I'm not sure whether maybe I might have left anything out. Thank you very much.
Okay, I, I can't see DG coming in. So, Minister, I believe we can now open the floor to members for their engagements. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add or are you fine? I'm fine, Chair. Uh, let's rather have an interaction with the, with, the, with the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see Honorable Mananiso's hand has already gone up. Um, can I note other hands of members, please? Perhaps as we wait for members to indicate um, their interest to engage. From my side, Minister, when it comes to the skills plan, I think for now, if one can just bring forth um, some recommendations as, uh, on how we go about the process, I think it would be very important that definitely industry and private sector is included in these conversations, um, given I think what I alluded to earlier on to say, um, you know, it can't be that we as government invest in, um, in education in as much as we do, yet we, we don't have young people being absorbed by industry. And of course, ours is not, ultimate, is not solely to have young people being employed, but also to create young people who can be employers, who can be entrepreneurs, who can start companies and so forth, and businesses and so forth. But we, 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 we know that um, there's the, the, a lot of us in the system need to take responsibility, including industry. So I think, yes, definitely the, the, the conversation that we, we started to have, or, or not started, because I mean, conversation has been ongoing, but part of the conversations we were having um, at the TVET Industry Partnership Summit did allude to this. Um, and, and, and to be honest, the numbers um, are not, uh, are not in terms of industry playing their part in coming on board and being part of the consultative processes of government saying, well, these are the skills that we want to harness young people in. You know, what do you think as industry? I don't think that, um, you know, we, we are where we would ideally like to be in terms of that, right? And so, um, and so, and so I really think that that particular, um, uh, uh, stakeholders very important to consult with and I mean we are aware of the resistance um, and and I don't know how to say it but the starachness you know the slow pace um, that is there and, uh, and and maybe it needs us to have a collective voice as as members as individuals as citizens in the country of saying the private sector needs to come on board in terms of the social compact that the president always speaks to so so I think firstly, that's a very key stakeholder that we need to have. I mean, a lot of what I'm gonna say are recommendations, right? Because we are in the process of, 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 of creating this master skills plan. Um, and, and okay, then, then perhaps let me go to a question quickly. Do we have possible dates for phase one and phase two of this particular process? I think phase one, um, sorry, I just need to go up in my notes. Phase one is mainly stakeholder consultations and review of documents, I think. And then phase two, um, we'll speak to the project. Uh, would involve the development of the countrywide master skills plan as a completion of the socioeconomic impact assessment system. So do we have dates for, for, for possible dates for phase one and phase two? I think it would be very important that um, our plan looks into conversations around um, artificial intelligence, particularly in um, what we like to stress when we engage with the DSI um, on, on strengthening a digital, an e-government. Yeah, strengthening an e-government. I mean, we've had this conversation with NASPERS and SASA and SARS and wanting that interface to happen much quicker um, to ensure that you know, young South Africans don't have to perpetually um, uh, prove their indigence. And there they have been strides that we have made in the NASFA system, but it's not where we want to be. Um, but I mean, we, we, we envisage this e-government at a greater scale where you know, across government departments, if I'm a young person who wants to apply for funding to start a business, to do whatever, the moment I put my finger on I don't know, some machine at whichever department, it captures me and understands, it gives a background 
of who Nompendulo is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I really think the type of skills that we need to be having need to be able to strengthen our government to be more efficient and effective um, and truly deliver to the needs of the people. And I think we can look into um, how an e a strengthened e-government system can assist with that. Of course, we can't have this conversation in isolation to the energy um, uh, uh, sustainability that we need, right? Because how do you have, uh, you can't even speak about ICT um, without speaking about energy. Uh, you can't speak about e-government without addressing the, the two, the first two, right? So, so that also then pushes us as a sector to have to um, incorporate into our skills plan, into this master skills plan, um, a response or skills that will be able, that will aid us to respond to the energy, um, the lack of energy sustainability, or if I want to call it an energy crisis in our country. And I think minister, you yourself have um, uh, uh, alluded to how, you know, this particular moment where we, we have a lack of energy sustainability, um, create an opportunity for us as a sector to respond. Um, you know, so, so I think we, we also need to be very clear in responding to that in, this, in the master skills plan. Um, I think it's important that in line with the view that the sector is responsible for everyone post school. Um, <sighs> I, I, I'm of the view, comrades, oh, sorry, colleagues, that we, apologies for that, honorable members, that we have a, a huge crisis in terms of our public servants um, and how the policies of government translate um, from elected leadership um, all the way down to, to, to public servants, the person, the cashier who's literally dealing with your home affairs application, who's dealing with your license renewal and so forth. The policies are very clear, but the experience of citizens on the ground is very problematic. And that for me creates an importance for us as a, as a country um, to look into what skills we need to provide to strengthen the Batupili ideals of our government. Um, Minister, I don't know what the relationship between ourselves and the National School of Government is. Um, and, 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 and how do we, within this master skills plan, consider whatever relevant skills we need to provide to public servants in order to, to bring to life the policies um, of our country. Um, then of course, the interface between the skills plan and curriculum. I, I think uh, DG, if you're on the platform now, and, and maybe, I, I don't know, the, the, so from the moment we identify a skills shortage or skills need and we say, okay, th this is the skill we need to be providing in the TVET program, or the university program, the CET program, to the actual change on the curriculum and what is taught in the classroom, that time lapse. I'm not, a, I think I don't understand it. I don't think, I don't know how, I think I don't have an appreciation of how long that is supposed to take. Um, or from the process of where we identify it to say, okay, we will put it in uh, to, to we'll like incorporate it into the curriculum and then to when it is taught in the classroom. Um, or when we say, for example, the particular qualification that is irrelevant, um, we, we keep saying that we are worried about the numbers or, or number of graduates um, in, in, in human resource management. Um, but I don't know, Maybe can we be brought into confidence on, 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 on the process of getting to day zero? I mean, I don't think we want to eradicate the qualification, but we want to lessen the numbers, right? And, and what is the plan? What is the roadmap to that day where we say, okay, we're sitting with numbers that make more sense for our system. And therefore we're not graduating young people who we are concerned about where they will find themselves post um, uh, a certification. So I think one needs to just appreciate that also in the skills in, in the skills plan and how it translates to curriculum change. Um, and then, you know, given of course the history of the CT program and the fact that it was part of the TVET program and it was moved and now as a standalone item. Um, 
when I listen sometimes to, uh, you know, lecturers and colleagues in the CT program on the ground and what they envisage to be the CET program. Um, I think that the master skills plan should help us to clearly articulate um, the interface between what should be offered through the CET program, through the TVET program and through the university program. Um, I think I, I will leave it at that for now. I see many hands have gone up. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll come back at a later stage. So I'll take Honorable Mananiso, Honorable Sibia, Honorable King, Honorable Matlazi, and Honorable Lutia. Um, Honorable Mananiso. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, let me start by actually welcoming the presentations. And I just want to check if I'm audible, Chairperson. We can hear you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair, let me welcome the presentation with a comment to say that one of the things that we are good at as government uh, of today is that we are told that we are good planners, but we cannot implement. And I think I share the same sentiments with you to say that we're doing things uh, on a slow pace. And one would want to comment to the team to say that uh, colleagues, it is important that uh, as we execute this one country, one skills development plan, all of us, we are activists. I don't believe that the boardrooms, they do uh, actually bring what we would want to do as government. But, you know, being out there, working on the ground, being all over, it will make us, you know, fast track the process of ensuring that we bring the services to our people at that particular time when they need them. So it is important that we move at speed in terms of executing this particular project as we would want to execute it. Uh, Chair, uh, I just want to recommend as well to the team to say that with the, the presentation that they have uh, actually written the problem statement, they can have a template or a spreadsheet that would have from the um, problem statement to the gaps to what they think is the best solution to address those particular uh, 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 challenges. So I just want to recommend to them that perhaps in future, they need to give us this particular presentation in a template form so that we are able to follow through if really, really what they have identified as best solution, it is exactly the best solution that would actually address those particular problems and the gaps. And I, I, I think, Chairperson, uh, on the issue of uh, phases, we, we need to have a specific time frame so that we are able to do our oversight and accountability properly. Because when it's only we are, we are only told phase one, uh, stakeholders consultation or that it's so interesting, but we just want to check as well when will that thing uh, be done. And I want to recommend that when they do the phase one, uh, noting what the minister could have said in terms of the relationship between the workplace and uh, institution issue, it is a very serious problem. So I just want for them to go out in terms of calling those who could have housed this particular intent without anybody intervening. Because I, I know I've, when I was a youth coordinator, I would do some uh, testimonials for specific students from West Coast who were seeking for in-house in certain institutions. And they would be asked to bring a testimonial from anybody who knows them, from prominent offices. So I would write those particular uh, uh, letters for those particular interns. And I then, I understood that this particular process of, uh, you know, from institution to workplace, it is not properly coordinated. It is by that particular experience. So I'm very happy, Minister, that uh, you have alluded on that as a problem and uh, you, you have noted it that the solution is to have a better coordination of everybody working together to ensure that uh, that particular part of skills transfer is actually properly coordinated in this particular plan. So I, I'm I'm pleased about what actually you could have said on your statement. And uh, 
chairperson, the other thing uh, that one would want to speak on is, uh, I just want to check with the department uh, if all that they could have planned prior uh, to to date, have they actually achieved those particular targets planned? And if not, what were the issues? Because we we have taken note of dates on on, on the plan of legislation processes and as it were uh, from today moving to 2023. But I just want to check if on those ones that that we have passed those particular data, have they actually achieved what they could have planned as 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 a, an office? Uh, let me go to my other questions is with regards to what are the risks that may inhibit the proper implementation of the MSP, and how will those particular risks be mitigated? Uh, have all twenty one cities aligned their annual performance plans? to address these challenges in various sectors of the economy and country in general? If not, kindly provide a list of sectors that have not done so. What are the budgetary implications for the MSP? And lastly, Chairperson, uh, it's how will this implementation of the MSP be monitored? Because uh, every time we are being told about monitoring and evaluation, but we, I, I think it's very rhetoric that we are told about that, but we don't actually see it happening as something that is so enforced in our institutions that people can able to account as it when the process unfolds. And lastly, Chair, I think from my side as a person who has actually benefited through skills development programs, uh, with what I have read through this particular two presentation, I, I, I think. This is one of the processes that it's good for purpose to ensure that we speak to supply and demand uh, uh, issue where there's an equilibrium between skills development and economic market. Uh, I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Manamiso. Honorable CBR. Um, thanks, Chairperson. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, morning to everyone. I, I think um, regarding the questions which were tabled, I think we are waiting for the responses from the department with, with the recommendations to the public. It can be interventions, mechanism, uh, the role uh, or the role should be played by the, the the department. I think it will be easier to conduct with the public as a whole. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Sibia. Honorable King. Good morning, Chairperson and colleagues on the platform. Um, Chairperson, I'm also just going to give some form of comment. Um, I'm glad to see that at some stage there is going to be a master plan. Um, it's something that we could actually say that at first we've always been putting the cart before the horse instead of the horse before the cart. Whereas this master plan should have come before all other plans and policies were in place to give strategic direction um, on the policy directive um, and also to ensure that we streamline um, the skills development trajectory according to the master plan. But nonetheless, I'm glad it is finally here. Um, also, the main concern that we should also have is how as us as a country um, position ourselves in terms of our specialization and our niche markets, and do we still align most of our skills into that direction? Um, because at the moment, you would find that in most cases, South Africa, our policy is trying to be all over the place. Um, and with our skills, we're trying to be everything for everyone, but we forget, we forgetting that we're supposed to have a little niche and a specialization. Like in the past, we were very well known um, in our manufacturing. We were known um, at the, we were the first ones to develop uh, the Rue um airplane for the army. So those are the things that we, that I think when we discuss the, when they discuss it in the cabinet, they should be very clear on. Um, then also what I would like to say is, yes, this is going to be a more decentralized model, a centralized model, 
I would like to see when we eventually get another presentation, when they develop it further, on how it will be decentralized into different industries with the CETAs, how it will be decentralized into institutions of higher learning, um, and also how it will be decentralized into businesses themselves um, to get a clear understanding of how they're going to properly involve private public partnership as well. Um, then everyone has been talking about the timelines and the processes. I would like to get that as well. Um, the timelines, the budgetary um, implications together with the timelines, um, stakeholder engagement, um, as well as when they are going to have a discussion with the Department of, of Employment and Labor in to practically get them on board on the master skills plan to ensure that the critical skills list um, is properly adhered to. And lastly, how basic education would then filter into the whole system, because that is where most of our problem starts, that at the basic and foundational level, most of the learners or the cohort for the higher education and for the job market are not properly skilled on the, on the, on the school level. Um, so I would like to see how that would then also be incorporated and also filtered into um, focus schools and schools of skill. So thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable King. Uh, Honorable Litsia. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, Chairman. I was trying to open the the mic. Am I audible? Uh, yes, we can hear you, Moran. Thank you very much. Um, let me take this opportunity to greet you, uh, all honorable members. Uh, welcome back, the Minister and uh, DG uh, in the motherland. Uh, greet them as well. Uh, the rest of the team uh, from the department. I think uh, Minister and uh, the DG and the team, uh, maybe let me start uh, by saying that um, <clears throat> um, we welcome the One Plan, One Country initiative. We, we really do. Uh, in fact, any other comment that seeks to suggest a criticism of some sort for bringing this uh, plan into place. Uh, you can quote me, just ignore it. Uh, I think it's high time that uh, uh, we treat uh, any board in the country who seeks to criticize a progressive suggestion or a progressive initiative. Uh, <laughs> Uh, harshly so, because I mean, how do you want uh, to criticize a progressive uh, something? Sometimes, I mean, let's let's uh, let's be serious. This is a progressive plan. I think, uh, honestly, on I've been covered uh, greatly on the questions by uh, by um, uh, Honorable Mananiso. And, you know, I'm not sure. Maybe it's because you know we grew up together, so. Uh, she she reads my mind sometimes on on some of the questions. Uh, maybe the one question, uh, Minister, would be um, <clears throat> whilst noting your in your in your opening, I think of the second or the closing, you would have said um, uh, obviously the presentations will be short because. They are not dealing with the specific bills themselves, but the process uh, of going uh, into, into dealing with the bills. Uh, maybe the question there would be, when do you think we can, uh, uh, when, when, will, when, when will this uh, proposal be presented to cabinet for approval? Uh, and then how long will that process take so that uh, we are able to start with the second phase uh, of, of, of this great initiative, which will be the bills. I think one thing that our government has been criticized on correctly might be that uh, 
we take time sometimes to to implement even even uh, the progressive things like this one so what is it that uh, can be done uh, to shorten the period of um, um, implement or of moving to the second phase which will be to dealing with specific uh, bills that will bring uh, this one plan one country into into life uh, i think that will be the only the only question and i think uh, on the issue of monitoring uh, uh, these things i think honorable mananiso would have covered me because that's another thing that we sometimes lack. we bring progressive things to the fore and then we don't uh, uh, monitor you know the 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 progression and all of those things which might create a lot of problems for us uh, and can create an unnecessary criticisms. I think uh, uh, there was a point where Honorable Mkacho was, uh, was asking, I'm not sure, Honorable Mkacho, if uh, you would have touched on the, on the, on this one, but I'm going to, to ask on it. Uh, the, the, the CITAS minister, um, um, with the one plan, one 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 country, a great initiative. Have they aligned their APPs uh, to address skills challenges in various sectors uh, of the economy and the country in general? Uh, if they have not, maybe kindly provide a list of uh, sitters that have not done so. Uh, and probably maybe with the with the reasons why, uh, because I think if 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 this one plan one country comes comes from us, it should be you know entities in our departments, in our department uh, should be leading greatly here on this one. So the first one will be the the issue of the CITAS, um, and then what is the budgetary implication of MSP? Uh, uh, I know Honorable Kim was asking uh, to that effect. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, and 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 maybe on the CITAS again, would all of them be in a position to to implement the MSP over and above alignment of uh, the APPs? And if not, uh, which which CITAS? Uh, may not be able to implement this MSP and the reasons uh, thereof. And I think uh, uh, on maybe add, the monitoring part of, of this thing is extremely important, uh, Minister. And I want to emphasize because Honorable Mananiso asked on it, how will we monitor uh, these things? Uh, how often uh, and what will be the mechanisms that will be put in place to monitor and all of those things? Uh, uh, without uh, wasting time, Chairperson, thank you very much and uh, good morning and uh, welcome, uh, Minister and uh, the DG back to the motherland. Away. Thank you, Honorable Litsi. Honorable Maslati. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Good morning to yourself, the Minister and the team from the Department and all Honorable Members and everyone on the platform. Chair, let me welcome both presentations made by the department on the legislation and on the uh, schools master's plan. Um, my questions, Chair, or oh, my first comment on the first presentation is that one would have hoped that the presentation gives a little bit of more information in relation to what is what is it that we're going to say? What do we need for this particular plan? I think it doesn't give if it doesn't give much more information besides you know the bureaucratic processes. One does not get the meat out of it. You know, ordinarily, if I was in another meeting, I would say I don't get the politics of this particular presentation out of what we have been presented before us. So. However, one would accept and take note of the comments made by the minister 
uh, and would therefore locate them within the presentation itself, at least to try to get where we are moving. Well, in as far as the alignment of schools, um, what is it that we are trying to achieve that has not been achieved within the current arrangement? And what will be the difference between the current status quo and what the plan intends to achieve? Secondly, the, the timelines. <clears throat> For us, to, I, I, I've, I've noted in the presentation, there were issues about network and so forth and so on. What would be the timeline that will, this particular plan will be you know, in place? And what has been the attitude of other stakeholders, including business and industry? What is the involvement of trade and industry in this particular process to make sure that we indeed, you know, this one plan, one country, becomes a, 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 you know, a reality, you know, it's something that we see because all other stakeholders would have participated over and above the fact that they would participate through NetLeg. Um, Chair, on the budgetary constraints, um, it's, it's, it's not clear how much will this plan cost? How will it, you know, beneficiation versus cost? How will it, it benefit our people. And most probably because, of, but as a younger generation of members of parliament or of the movement or, or society, one would be biased to young people. How is it going to benefit uh, young people at macro level? Because when we, speak about skills, we tend to believe that people go to TV and be able to do work, but how do, do we expand at that particular level? To say you can create your own business and still grow and to become an entrepreneur that can actually hire other younger people to participate in the mainstream of economy. That will be my question in the first, in relation to the first presentation. The second presentation on legislation, I just want to align myself with Honorable Mananiso. You can continue, Honorable Mashad. Thank you very much. It will be on the timelines of uh, um, the process because we would want to you know, exit uh, this term as members of parliament having processed those legislations. I could see that the timelines is something end of December 2023. And 2024, there will be elections. So we would want, if they, if that is the case, let's stick through those timelines so that we are able to finalize uh, those uh, bills without necessarily uh, deferring them to uh, the seventh parliament. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Masati. Honorable, is that a legacy hand? Is that a new hand? Uh, legacy, 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 legacy. Okay, thank you, Honorable Mitsuya. Um, okay, can I just then appreciate all the questions from members, but also um, so colleagues, there's, there's, there, there are situations where um, young people enroll for qualifications, and I will speak from my experiences in the university program, where they enroll for qualifications. And when they enroll, 
let's start it with the career uh, career guidance office um, and then move it to the lecturers as you're going through the three, four years that you're there. And as you're going through this journey, you keep asking, you know, so what exactly can I do with this qualification? What exactly can I do with this qualification? And you'd be told that you can do this, you can do that, you can do this. And there are often qualifications that aren't as clear as teaching or professional qualifications, you know, like uh, teaching, medicine, lawyers, CAs. Um, so engineers. So um, you, you have this idea that, you know, you, you, the journey of employment will be quite clear. And then you start applying for internships or you start applying for learnerships. And, uh, you know, people can't appreciate the qualification that you're doing within, within their sector. So, you know, um, you apply, they'll tell you, no, there's, there's, we, we can't, there's, there's nothing for you to do here. And, uh, I think it's a it's a crisis that we have, you know, and I don't know how. I, I actually think the challenge is on both sides. So it's on those who are employing, not appreciating the skill set that the, this young person can come with from the qualification they've done, but also not a clear, deliberate process of really aiding young people from basic education to understand what are some of the qualifications they would be uh, enrolling or applying for? And I think, and, 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 and that's really, I mean, I know many of us could have possibly done some qualifications for the sake of saying, for the sake of I must be, I must have, I must be in university in first year, or I must be in a team at college in first year. I can't be sitting around at home doing nothing. And so you take whatever is available without an understanding and appreciation of what exactly um, this particular qualification could be skilling you with or for. And so that, that's really where we see an important conversation that needs to take place with basic education, but even with these um, institutions of ours in, in, in how we handle the application and enrollment process. Um, so that we don't waste the, like, I mean, with, with NASA's beneficiaries or those who are funded by the state, we actually don't have <laughs> leeway not to utilize the limited resources that we have as effectively and efficiently that we, as we can, you know? So if, we, if we're finding a young person, we must be certain that this, or not certain, but to the best, I mean, we can't, we can't be 100% secure, but we must know that we would have given them the best um, counseling that they could get to ensure that um, they don't waste their time um, and, and know the limited resources that we have. And, 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 and that's also, of course, appreciating the fact that no learning is a waste of time. You know, it just, it just goes back to what do you do with that information and skill set that, that you would have learned. Um, so I think we need to do that and also really applying a gendered lens to, to the master skills plan. That would be very important, um, you know, to appreciate, uh, yeah, you know, gender, uh, um, um, plans of, of government in in whatever our master skills plan will look like in the end. Minister uh, Dichi, uh, Didi Chikasa, colleagues from the department, thank you very much for the presentations that you have made. These are the comments, questions, um, by and large, I think recommendations coming from members to say, as we are, as we are putting together this master skills plan, um, do take the following into, into cognizance. Um, the gig economy, the digital economy that is booming, um, you know, agriculture and need for us to have food security, the need for us to have energy security. There's a lot of conversation around high, the hydrogen economy. Um, you know, uh, there's conversation we having, that we will be having on, 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 on Friday with DSI around climate change. And so, you know, with all these needs, um, socioeconomic development needs of the country, how, do our, how does our master skills plan uh, respond to this? Honorable King saying, you know, what, what, what can we bring forth through our master skills plan where we can say and be intentional and plan and say, this is uniquely South African. This is what South Africa is known for. So we're really excited, Minister, as Honorable Litsi has articulated about this um, one country, one plan. I think, I, I hope I'm saying it right. 
uh, I need to <laughs> go back to that slide. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's one country, one plan. Really excited um, about it and, 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 and what it really can do uh, for our country. And of course, um, the implementation thereof will be very important. So thank you very much, um, Minister. And uh, we, we'd like to then hand over to yourselves for your responses um, to the comments and questions of members. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. And, and thanks to the members really for all the, the comments, observations, suggestions. Uh, we really appreciate this. Perhaps the best way to do it, Chair, with your permission, is to perhaps suggest if the officials have got anything, well, they need to respond to some of these things, including the budgetary aspects and such things. And then I will just come in at the end just to pick up on whatever they might not have responded to or, and, or directly questions that were meant for myself. DJ? Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, <clears throat> members of the Portfolio Committee. Uh, I, I've been taking notes uh, copiously uh, to make sure that um, I don't miss out on the, on the questions asked by the honorable members, particularly because this is a presentation of difference. We are right at the beginning, which means uh, we'll be wiser for, for the advice that we are getting today. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I, th I thought, Minister, uh, following the line of, of your earlier remarks, opening remarks, uh, that the purpose of the, of the presentations is to um, you know, alert the members of the portfolio committee of the path that you are going to be following uh, you know, in this regard. Therefore, I feel that all of these questions must uh, then be the guidelines for us from the portfolio committee and uh, that we are going to follow. And I don't think there is a point in us trying to answer uh, questions, um, but it is to actually take these questions seriously and embed them in our plan. Uh, no, no, honorable chair, you, you make a point about the interface between the MSP and the, and the curriculum policy of our department, a huge comment uh, to, for me, um, you, you, you know, and, and you could, could also further align it to uh, the white paper on, on post-school education and training and other pieces of legislations and plans within this ministry. Uh, in my mind, I have the decadal plan that brings on board the issues around the, the hydrogen economy, uh, which you, you have sharply raised uh, the, the gender lens, the, the, the you know, issues around career pathing, uh, the matters that deals with socioeconomic uh, and organizational matters, uh, interface between uh, uh, different, uh, you know, you know, uh, areas in the, in the PSET system, uh, particularly TVET and community education and, and, and training programs, aligning all of these to our annual reports on, um, you know, occupations in high demand, you know, making sure that uh, the plan is, is focused. And, uh, you know, uh, this is what, uh, Honorable Let's see, you know, you know, says sharply. And uh, may I, uh, Honorable Let's see, uh, thank you for, for your observation. I think, I think uh, we cannot underestimate the importance of uh, a positive comment to a group of uh, officials that are really passionate about their country and they want to make a difference. And if they 
they get positive you know feedback and, and encouragement it can actually you know fuel a much more progressive action and i think uh, we don't uh, work uh, expecting to be recognized for the contribution we are making but we we when when it happens it it is not business as usual in fact it 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 warrants that we set higher standards so that we we never disappoint and thank you very much uh, honorable lady i will say uh, therefore in that regard honorable lady that the the CETAs and the alignment of their programs uh, particularly to or the macro plans to the app is is crucial and i think that is going to not only inform the planning but is also going to inform the monitoring and 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 evaluation processes uh, of the department. And uh, uh, regarding the the cost implications uh, for the plan, uh, this has been uh, carefully considered. Uh, first and foremost, this plan is an intergovernmental plan. It is it it therefore the cost of of the initial work, they are going to be borne by the budget that is already allocated to the department for policy making uh, within the planning branch, which uh, uh, we we have. Uh, but when it comes to issues around uh, intergovernmental fora, uh, you know uh, that needs to be, you know, established. We align ourselves with existing structures. For example, if you were to look into career guidance and how it is uh, structured, you have intergovernmental fora uh, that is funded by uh, various departments that are part of the, of, of, of the fora. Uh, but the Department of Higher Education as a department that is a, a lead department uh, has to ensure that the resources, uh, you know, are available for um, monitoring and evaluation, uh, for further research that is required, uh, so that we keep updating these plans and align them to new and emerging, you know, you know, you know, uh, best practices and trends, not only within the country, also across the world. These are taken uh, a note of, and uh, we will be uh, specific about the, the figures uh, uh, once uh, our conversations with other departments that seek to indicate exactly what is the roles and responsibilities of each of the departments is going to be. You, you make a point, uh, uh, Honorable Mkacho, around the involvement of um, you know, uh, the economic cluster uh, or the departments in the economic cluster. And uh, I wish to assure you that uh, indeed they are involved, they are part and parcel of the process. And uh, actually they've, they've been right from the beginning uh, in attendance of our meetings, uh, which uh, has involved not only national departments, but it has involved provincial departments, as well as uh, uh, some uh, uh, representatives of SALGA and local government. Uh, it's it's still a very early, and the minister's comments earlier on uh, are quite uh, telling that we this is the earliest stage of the, uh, this 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 direction we are taking, and uh, therefore, honourable king, uh, your 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 take around uh, the issue of uh, you know how we involve uh, partnerships with the private sector. Uh, partnerships with institutions, uh, partnerships with um, um, you, you know other role players uh, that have an interest in 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 the, in the plan, is taken uh, 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 very well uh, by ourselves. You make an emphasis on the specialization uh, uh, issues around this, and 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 my comment around the occupation high demand. Uh, you know, you know, seek to try and say, moving forward in the department, we we are really informed by 
the 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 this issue of ensuring that uh, uh, the economic needs of our country are taken into account in the development of 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 the plan, including our role as South Africa in supporting SADC and 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 Africa in the implementation of Agenda 2063, as well as uh, of course driving the National Development Plan. Um, Honorable uh, uh, Masatsi's uh, comments uh, are taken uh, very well, and uh, they are they are particularly the issue of the beneficiation of the of the of young people of South Africa uh, is taken as an important uh, you know you know you know you know matter. We are working with the uh, presidency. If you've noticed, the minister uh, has uh, uh, established a very strong. Uh, collaboration between our department and ministry uh, with the Ministry of Youth, uh, um, uh, of Women, Youth and, and, and People uh, with Disabilities uh, in the presidency. And, and uh, you have seen how we've collaboratively worked on the um, June 16, um, you know, celebrations, um, all the work that was uh, all the displays, all the all the all the exhibitions that that were there from the department is not what we have seen in the past. Uh, this is because we we seek to strengthen the the the, the focus of uh, that mini, uh, that ministry of women, youth, and people uh, people with disabilities uh, uh, on the issues that 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 uh, are important in our department um uh, i would like mr mvalo to to just make a a, a comment around uh, um um and the the issue of the existing plans and 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 how we're working to 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 bring this because this is what uh, honorable Sibia and honorable mananiso have raised uh, uh, around uh, lessons learned from the from the you know the work that we are doing currently and how such lessons inform the planning so that we don't repeat the the mistakes of the past i think this is very clear honorable uh, mananiso um and uh, but i would like my colleague to to just make a comment about this um uh, because it is really really important i i am very encouraged by the by the the energy you know, of the various government departments, particularly provincial government, but governments, on an, on the opportunity to contribute to the plan, and and uh, uh, the the this is uh, my comment at this point in time, taking into account that most of the questions um, uh, uh, seek to advise us, uh, honourable chair of the portfolio committee. Uh, you you make a, po a comment around digital economy um, uh, as well as the hydrogen economy as well as you uh, indicate how important it is that the decadal plan uh, you know is uh, also taken into account in in the in the finalization uh, of of our planning uh, mr Mvalo. Thanks very much, uh, DJ. Very good uh, morning to the minister, the chairperson, the members of the portfolio committee, as well as uh, colleagues in our platform. Thanks very much once again, DJ. Uh, perhaps I just wanted to indicate that the challenge that is at our best as the country, uh, this has been raised on a number of occasions, is uh, unemployment especially for those who do not have grade 12 or those who are having grade 12. Because if you look at 7.9 million of people unemployed in our country currently, about uh, uh, 6.5 million of them, they either have grade 12 or no grade 12. So it tells them therefore us as to where is the challenge, where there is no absorption or less absorption uh, by our economy. So those are the areas that we need to uh, be targeting on. The other area, uh, DJ, also just wanted to quickly comment on uh, almost all members have been raising the, the issue of uh, 
uh, the, the youth and gender uh, 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 lenses that you must be using. I, I was looking into, for example, into artisans that were produced by 31st March, 2022. We produced in 19,536, 19,536. I know in the prior year, we produced about 15,000. Uh, Pre-COVID, we produced about 24,000. Then uh, immediately in, in 2021, we produced about 15,000. And now in 2022, we produced 19,536. So it tells us then, therefore, uh, that the employers, they are beginning to open up uh, their workplaces for, uh, for training. And as you think also, what is very important is what the minister has done on 1st April 2020, 2021, uh, whereupon he has increased the grant uh, that is given to employers who are hosting uh, apprentices in the country from 165,000 uh, to 206,000. It means then, therefore, uh, we, we are assisting employers. We are calling upon employers to open up their workplaces. We are saying this is what uh, we are contributing or we can contribute as the, as the Department of post School Education and Training. Uh, out of that 19,536, uh, Honorable Mkachwa and uh, Honorable Mashati, 40, 14,682 are young people. 14,682, that is 75% of those artisans uh, found competent by 31st March uh, 2022. So it tells them, therefore, that our programs are very much uh, targeting. Uh, though if we look into women in particular, we're still lagging behind because uh, out of that 19,536, 22% are women. So it means then therefore it is the work that we need to be undertaking as the society in terms of encouraging women in particular to join artisanal uh, programs. And we know there's a high level of absorption rate in our artisanal programs. Our own studies that we have done indicated that the level of absorption is 80% plus uh, for all those who have participated or who have completed their trade testing. The issue, uh, DG uh, Minister, Honorable Members, that is being raised quite very strongly is the demand-led. Because to us, demand-led, hence we, we are producing occupations in high demand, a critical skills list that we are working with the Department of, of Home Affairs and even our own economic reconstruction and recovery skills strategy, we have identified about 105 occupations. All those occupations are demand led. So it means then therefore our interventions must always respond to what is required by our economy. If we are to address a skills mismatch, which if we look into field of study as well, seated, you is at about 32.5% that the skills mismatch in our country. Well, if we look into Countries such as Peru, it's about 51%. Turkey is about 41.1%. So it's a challenge that we're faced with uh, internationally uh, addressing the skills mismatch. Even at BRICS countries, it's the same challenge that is being dealt with. Uh, DG, in the main, we, we met obviously with the CITAS that was in March uh, this year. Uh, the DG, the minister, the deputy minister, we all, with all the CITAS, a uh, one-on-one. -on -one. So the intention there was to ensure that CITAS, as part of their planning regime, uh, they are including occupations in high demand, critical skills list occupations, those occupations identified in the skill strategy to support economic reconstruction and recovery plan. So in our annual performance plans, uh, starting from 1st April uh, 2022, uh, CITAS will be uh, measuring them obviously against uh, uh, those uh, those areas uh, to check as to whether they are their interventions are really speaking into a uh, demand-led uh, skills which are required uh, by, by our economy. So it's something that is quite very critical to to all of us. Uh, I must also indicate uh, that each and every sitter is required in terms of the Skills Development Act to develop what you call is a sector skills plan. If let's say it's a CETA that is operating within the ICT, let's say MICT sector, a part of the work that it must do, it must work with the industrial employers within that sector 
to identify as to what are the occupations which are required within that particular sector. Then what they will do then after once they've identified all these occupations, uh, they will have your top 10 occupations and all those occupations, they are working with the industry. In any way, I must mention that in each and every board of the CETA or accounting authority, about 50% is uh, industry coming within that particular sector, as well as organized labor uh, coming within that particular sector. That is why then therefore, when they develop sector skills plan, at least you have people who are knowledgeable, who are experienced, who are eloquent in terms of that sector as to what is required in that sector so that we can address those skills occupations which are required in that particular sector. Then once that work is being, once that work is concluded, they will include that in the annual performance plan because they will be having uh, as part of the annual performance plan interventions that they will be using. It could be, there will be spasaries, the learnerships, work integrated learning and so on and so on. Uh, but then obviously, whilst they are doing that, they also take into account other uh, planning instruments whether it's your occupations in high demand, skills, studies, support, economic reconstruction, and recovery plan, critical skills list, and so on. I will then, I should think I will end there, uh, DG, at this uh, point in time. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Simbalo. May, may I hand that to the minister if he so wishes to? Uh, yes. Uh, th thank you very much uh, to, to make that question. Um, I've taken over. I thought that you were done with the officials. Uh, thank you to the honourable chair and uh, honourable members. Comments. I hope I'm audible. Let me just. Keep Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm closing the, the video because I'm just seeing that my network is not strong. I hope I'm audible. We can hear you, Minister. I think okay, it was the DG's um, network that was delayed. Okay, no, that's fine. Maybe just uh, to wrap up, uh, Evan, of course, acknowledged to say that uh, thank you very much for... <coughs> for your comments and suggestions. I, I just want to say, your, your comments are actually very helpful. That we may not specifically touch on some of them does not mean that they are not acknowledged or noted. And I think largely they contribute to assist us with the methodology uh, in developing a master skills plan. For example, the points raised by Honorable Manani, so if I can just use that. What are the risks? We can't answer that question now. What are the risks to a master skills plan? But it's an absolutely crucial question, which as we develop the master skills plan, we must pose and seek to answer. So uh, the, 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 the comment is indeed, uh, been very helpful. The first thing I'd just like to say is that the the dates, at the beginning, I, I did say that. I've asked the department to make sure that at least to produce the first version or the first iteration of a master skills plan by the end of this financial year, which means end of March, 2023 after which then we'll be able to take that first iteration to cabinet, uh, hopefully for, endorse, or for endorsement or for cabinet to say, this is going okay, go and do some further work or whatever the case may be. But that's the plan, such that one can say that by middle of next year, we should have be, been having a version of a master skills plan, an iteration, that's a better word, uh, that then we should actually be, be having. March, we produce it, and then within the following two to three months thereafter, next year after March, we are then able to present it before cabinet. And then hopefully go public then about it. 
uh, thereafter. You know, it may not be a perfect thing, but it would be the first iteration, which then of course will be enriched as we actually implement it. We are looking, Chair, at all the skills. I mean, the points you are raising about, for instance, the hydrogen economy, we are already asking the question, what kinds of skills would a hydrogen economy require? Uh, what kind of artisans? Or of the existing artisans, for instance, which ones may we need to retool in order to acquire what skills? Also, I will be engaging my government colleagues, other ministers and their departments, to be able to say what skills do they need in the sectors in which they operate. For example, Minister of Social Development may actually say, look, I have a huge shortage of social workers. I suspect at the moment she has the opposite problem, that she has got too many unemployed social workers, you know, that have been produced but uh, master skills plan for the auto sector may say, we are actually need so many motor mechanics now who understand electric vehicles, because that's the future. That's the, the direction that we are going. The DG mentioned the decadal plan. What are the skills implications of the decadal plan? So we are, we are, we are going to leave no aspect, no key sector and skills needs untouched. Which also needs me to may maybe clarify this matter, Chair, that the master skills plan, we want it to be a go-to thing for anyone who is interested in skills from whatever angle, whether it's an employer who wants to employ or whether it's an employer who wants to train or whether it's a student who wants to study it must be a go-to plan, which would also obviously guide sectors as well in terms of what skills uh, needs to be produced. Now, it will have to contain, obviously, your critical skills, your scarce skills, and all that, which, by the way, at the moment, the Home Affairs list of scarce skills is produced by us, Che. DHT, we produce it. The reason why it becomes a home affairs list is because then it guides home affairs on, 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 on its visas for work permits, for instance. So such that home affairs understands that if someone who has got such and such a skill applies for a visa, you know, if it is a scarce skill, we need to be encouraging those people to come across to our country to work here. Uh, we do work on that. It's not in competition, our list and the home affairs. We produce it. And then home affairs actually uses it for purposes of work permits. And importation of facilitate the importation of scarce skills that we may not have. You are right, Chair, the issue of skills planning and curriculum transformation is very important. That is why curriculum transformation is one of our foremost priorities, Chair. The University Capacity Development Program has got four pillars, and one of those pillars is curriculum transformation. Because with new technological developments, curricula needs to be updated now and again and be aligned to the needs of the economy, as well as uh, to technological changes that we have. We are also undergoing extensive curriculum revision in our TVET colleges, really very extensive, uh, that we, we, we are doing, and also even as part of the centers of specialization, so that we are able to produce the kind of skill that is needed today. So the issue of the relationship between skills planning and curriculum is a very important one. The master skills plan itself, by the way, we hope also will be able to inform curricula in our institutions in order to be able to produce the kinds of skills that we, we need. We welcome uh, Comrade my, my, uh, uh, Honorable Member Mananiso and, and, and uh, Honorable Member 
let's see here, on welcome, also welcoming uh, this. We ourselves regard this as a very important project and we are glad if you are supporting it. Albeit, of course, you'll be able to make your own critical interventions and suggestions. The issue of how it will be monitored is a methodological issue, as I have said. We will have to develop that. As we develop the plan, we will then be able to say with certainty, how should it be monitored? Reason for that being linked to the comment, one comment that was made by Honorable King. Honorable King says, uh, when will we decentralize this, this master plan? The master plan will have to happen at various levels at the same time, it will have to be implemented at various levels at the same time. For instance, we would like to have district skills plans, for example, as part even of the district development model. By the way, we've started, I've asked the department to say, just as a pilot, can they start with the two districts where myself and the deputy minister are deployed as champions by the president, by cabinet? Just those districts, let the CETAs and our department just go zoom into those districts and say, what are the skills needs? And what therefore should be something that will be closer to a district skills plan in that particular district. So there's nothing, by the way, which stops anybody from doing that. But we facilitated that as government. Our Human Resources Development Council has been encouraging the formation of provincial human resources development councils. Uh, DDG Valo, if I'm not mistaken, seven of our nine provinces have their own human resources development councils now. And the two that do not have, we are encouraging them to actually have them, where you bring together all stakeholders to discuss human resources and skills needs and strategies to produce skills for each province. So there is nothing that as a master skills plan is a centralized thing. It will be a centralized thing insofar as it is a plan. It gives you a picture, you know, of what the situation is like. But it will have to be implemented at various levels, right up to individual workplaces. So I thought that I needed to, to, to indicate that, because sometimes I know, Honorable King, that uh, the DA is always suspicious. The ANC wants to centralize everything. And now we want to see things in terms of a province and a national, even where there's no need to see things that way. A plan, a master skills plan will have to live in every workplace in the country, in every district, in every municipality, in every province. It will actually have in every region, you know. In fact, the master skills plan should act to assist you know, regions, localities to develop their own plans. In fact, it, we hope it will even provide methodology to develop skills plans for big government projects. For instance, we had already developed a skills plan for the government's infrastructure program. You know, the, 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 the sector industrial plans or projects, the SIPs, we actually had skills plans for SIPs. So we hope that this thing will be dynamic and be able to leave and be used in that way. That's why we are even talking about iterations, different versions at different times. Now, I think honorable, let's say I've answered your question that we hope to present this to cabinet Three, within three months after the end of the financial year, when we have produced the first iteration, that then we are going to be able to take it to cabinet and then go out thereafter, you know, to say, this is what we think actually should be the skills plan. As I say, it may not be perfect, but as long as it will be something that be begins to bring together one picture of 
skill supply and demand in the country. That's what it would actually be trying to do, amongst other things. I think the issue about getting the CETAs into, into play on this is important. But we also have got to get our universities into this. We have also got to get to, go to get our team at colleges into this, guided by the, the, the master skills plan. Uh, <clears throat> Honorable uh, Mashati, uh, I think that also your, your issue has been responded to. Your question, what do we want to achieve? I think that perhaps I've answered this, that what we do not have at the moment, we have a lot of sector skills plans, linked or even industrial plans, skills plans, linked to particular industries or sectors, you know, and so on. We want to have an overarching picture. We want to be able to answer the question, how many civil engineers does South Africa need this year, for instance? How many do we have? How many do we need? How many do we have who are at university? How many do we have who are doing their professional training? When will they finish? And so on. That's what a master skills plan should be able to give you an indication of what is it that we are actually talking about. Those are some of the things that we will be wanting to, to, to achieve. There will always be sectoral skills plans. There will always be regional skills plans. We should encourage that. The most important thing is that we should be having this overarching uh, master skills plan, one country, one plan, that will actually be able to be a reference point to everybody, which will also allow government to plan better, which will allow certain industries, you know, and companies to, to, to actually plan better. I hope that uh, this chair takes us to the end of uh, our, our presentation then uh, with the answer to this question. So the one last thing I forgot to, to mention, I had hoped, it's because I had hoped the teacher was gonna say something you raised something about our relationship with the National School of Government. We have got a very good relationship with the National School of Government. There's still a lot more, by the way, that we want to do together with the National uh, School of Government. Uh, we work very well with Mr. Zawed, who actually is heading that. We've even had joint uh, activities and actions. One of the programs we've had together between the the head of the National School of Government, led by him and our Director General, Dr. Sishi, was on the issue of recognition of prior learning. You know, uh, skills and knowledge acquired through practice and experience, and how does that get recognized and accredited in the civil service? Uh, recognition of prior learning actually is a key component of post-school education and training which we want to see everywhere. And we've agreed that in the public service, public service has someone been remaining behind about properly appreciating and making use of recognition of prior learning in order to be able to recognize skills that people have that, that may not be acquired, been acquired through a formal institutions, but through practice and be able to measure them. And we regard the National School of Government as very important also, by the way, part of the relationship is inevitable. The, 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 the head of the National School of Government was telling me just yesterday at the sidelines of the cabinet, Lehota, that they are in the process of accrediting through SACWA some of their qualifications that they are developing in the National School of Government so that when you get trained as a civil servant, you also get credit for what you've been trained, which you can be able to transfer if you want to continue in a university or in a team at college, that also can get recognized. So inevitably, in any case, there, is, there should be a close relationship between the National School of Government and ourselves. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, and to Honorable Members uh, for this opportunity. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you very much to the DG and to the DDGs. Um, Mr. Mkiba, also <laughs> thank you to yourself for uh, assisting there in the background. Oh, in the background. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. I think, um, firstly, we there is general excitement within the portfolio committee regarding this master skills plan, 
and what it could do for our country in, in terms of ensuring that our country has the requisite skills for us to see the type of socioeconomic development that could result in you know, the bettering of livelihoods of citizens and in their, and in their self-liberation. And so um, we, we will be um, closely monitoring the work of the department in finalizing or as they work on, 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 on this master skills plan and finalizing it to the moment of which we can then um, you know, have it as this guiding document, this overarching guiding document for government, for uh, spheres of government, um, for, for industry, and uh, for all of us, uh, so, you know, Minister, you've also alluded to, um, to young people uh, who, 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 who are prospective students, you know. You always say that um, our sector is responsible for, for everyone post-school. And so that, that, that I hope will be, um, this document I hope will be a guiding document to all of us um, as, we, as, we, as we leave school and enter various spheres um, of, 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 of our country. And so thank you very much, um, Minister, for, for the presentation. Um, I think there will be a need for us to follow up on discussions around legislation. There are, I think, a few concerns, but um, maybe we should uh, find a way, Anele, um, for us to have a working, I don't know, a meeting um, where we can just, um, maybe through Manco, uh, to, 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 to have engagements with the, 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 the ministry and the, and the department um, and then be able to come back to members, um, particularly responding to one of the concerns raised by Honorable Mashat. Um, colleagues, on Friday, we will meet again to engage on uh, climate change. Um, the Portfolio Committee on Environment uh, is not available um, because they have been busy with this uh, climate change bill. Uh, and so they have sent their apology for, for Friday. However, we will continue with the briefing um, briefed by the Department of Science and Innovation. Please, another reminder for next week, Wednesday, we will be engaging with the University of Pretoria on their um, progress in terms of transformation. It's a long-standing, uh, well, it's, yeah, we've been wanting to have this conversation for a very long time. And uh, colleagues are reminded that it is a physical meeting and you will be, ex you will be expected to be, um, in parla at, to be in parliament physically. Um, so those are just a few reminders uh, to members. And um, I think that brings us to the end of our meeting. Thank you so much, Minister, and to your colleagues. Thank you very much, honorable members. We will see each other on Friday. Or oh, well, in the chambers now, as we uh, uh, will be dealing with questions. Thank you so much. As well, Thank yeah. you very much, and honorable members. Sebo. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back and to everyone. <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> Yes. Thank you very much. Shop shop. Babum Valo, you've got a nice background there. Yes, that's where that, that's where the power lies, honorable let's see. <laughs> Recording stopped. We don't, power. we don't see this power, we only hear about it. Thank <laughs> you.